Hello iBus 340 students. My name is Peter Holden and I'm going to be your instructor for International Trade and Law. Uh, welcome to the COVID-19 pandemic new normal. I hope that it is a temporary new normal. We're online for the fall, but we're hoping to have classes resume in the spring, but we'll just have to wait and see. Online is a challenge at the best of times, but it's going to be particularly tricky for this course the way I've taught it in the past. However, I'm sure that working together we can get through it okay. Um, what I would like to do today is I would like to go through the course outline as instructors generally do. Um, then I would like to talk about um, the uh, grading profile, uh, the lecture schedule, then I want to give a little history of the course and explain how I approach it. Um, uh, and then I will try to conclude with uh, something I call how to pass this course, um, which is uh, of particular interest to you, I'm sure. All right, diving right into it, um, I'd like you to uh, uh, refer to the course outline. The top part is just administrative material. Um, we're all familiar with the um, acknowledgement of the native uh, territories, the business vision, mis mission statement, uh, coaching hours. Uh, coaching hours will not be in office. Uh, coaching hours will be done by email. If it's necessary to meet face-to-face, -face, I'm sure that we can hook something up on Teams. Uh, the course format is the other thing I want to talk about. The lectures will be delivered by videos um, and audio lectures, although for this particular course I don't think there'll be any audio lectures, just videos. I will post the links to the videos on eLearn. So as you go through the lecture schedule, which should be your sort of Bible for the course, um, you'll see something called Topic 1 and 2 uh, under September the 14th. Well, that means that that's the videos that you should be watching to get the uh, lectures for this part of the course. So you go, oh, okay, Topics 1 and 2, then you go to eLearn, you find the links, you click on the links, bingo, up comes my bobbing head, and for that I apologize. Um, I prefer in class so that I can do dancing and interact with the students. I find it frustrating to uh, just be staring into this little uh, lens. But as I said, we'll get through it. So then you can bring up my lecture guide from eLearn, which is a series of slides. You know, you're all familiar with those. Uh, it's my idiot's guide, not that you're the idiots, I'm the idiots. I have it so that I can go through it. And as I'm doing the video lectures, I make sure that I cover everything on those slides because you will be tested on the exam only what we go over in the videos and specific readings that I ask you to check on. So um, you can bring up the lecture guide and listen to my voice in the background, or you can look at my uh, wonderful face if that's all you want to do, um, or you can have a split screen and do both. Uh, now there are advantages to online, okay? And the first and most important advantage is you can never miss a lecture. <laughs> I mean, you know, you, uh, you get sick and, oh, I missed a lecture. Now I'm going to have to get somebody's notes. And I'm going to have to try to figure them out and copy them over. And then I'm going to have to talk to my instructor for th about things that I might have missed. And um, it's, it's a real problem. But when the videos are there, you can look at them early. You can look at them late. You can look at them right on time. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's a self-paced, uh, self-taught course in that respect. The other real advantage is in, in class, um, I lecture fairly quickly because there's a lot of material to get through. And so consequently, you might miss something in your notes. You have a gap. Well, then you have to come up after class and talk to me, or you have to come to my office hours and talk to me. Uh, but with the video, you go, oh, I missed that. And you just back it up. No problem, okay? Now, the other, the other advantage is... Um, is that uh, the way I do the course, I have not only the textbook, which we'll talk about in a little while, um, but I also have two packages of materials, um, a substantial package of materials with articles and some statutory material and some cases. Uh, and you had to buy that through the bookstore. Uh, and then I also have the business simulation package 
and we'll get into that in a big way later. But this is the the uh, the guts of the course, and you had to buy those. Well, you don't have to buy those. Um, I could have tried to arrange to have them printed and sold through the bookstore. COVID-19, I don't think anyone needs that risk. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put on eLearn the, only the key cases and statutory material um, and, and articles that I think we absolutely have to cover. Um, and then I'm going to put the whole business simulation on, uh, on eLearn so you don't have to buy those. So there's another advantage of um, uh, online learning. All right, back to the course outline. Um, we are getting to the uh, uh, required text. Uh, we used to use a, a textbook, um, Ray August International Business. It was American. The first drawback was that uh, it costs almost $100, $200. Uh, the second drawback was the United States has this tendency to believe that it's the center of the universe. Um, and there were, and it was obviously uh, keying on the American perspective. At one point, it even talks about how there's no such thing as moral rights to the integrity of the work with respect to copyright. Um, and uh, yes, just in Canada, to the north of them, there is the moral rights to the integrity of the work. But Canada, Canada, is there is there a country up there? Oh, I thought that was the 51st state. Uh, and then, of course, uh, European countries uh, also. Um, protect moral rights. So then I found this textbook and if you look at the number of tabs that I have in there, um, I use it. Now one of the drawbacks is I don't refer to it every class. Here's the textbook. Here's the textbook. I'm reading from the textbook. Okay. So you, you, know, you, don't, get the, you don't get the sense that I use it. And I don't lecture from it because this is... Um, legal aspects of international business, but there's a lot of public law, public international law in there. And we try to avoid that. We try to key on very practical aspects of doing trade and the legal pitfalls. So as a consequence, I've gone through topics in or what I think is the logical order to deal with. So you have to bounce around to use the textbook. So some, some students get to the end of the term and they go, well, I didn't use the textbook. Um, I don't know how you study best, um, but I really uh, think that um, it's important to um, read the material in the textbook for two reasons. Number one, it is going to uh, prepare you better for the examination. And number two, you're getting, the in my lectures, you're getting the world according to Peter Holden, okay? Whereas in the textbook, you will get another perspective as well. Uh, some one student said, uh, "Well, do I have to buy it?" No, um, I can't make you buy anything. <laughs> um, but uh, it's sort of like um, a contractor goes out to build a house but doesn't bring a hammer. Um, it's like a hockey player that goes to play hockey but doesn't bring a hockey stick. Um, it's sort of like a boxer who wants to box but with one arm tied behind his back. So it's it's a tool to be used if you can do the course without that tool more power to you. Um, it's in its third edition. It's on sale in the bookstore and they will actually send it out to you by mail, but then you probably already know this. And um, I'm just checking one thing. I wanted to see when the copyright was for this one. Copyright, copyright. Oh, there it is, 2015. So it is relatively up to date. Good. Um, okay. So that's the textbook. Um, now, I have my uh, lecture guide on Moodle. <clears throat> I have, and that's the slides that I go through. I have um, uh, lecture materials on Moodle, and you have to follow those, uh, you know, quite carefully. Okay, um, what I would like to do now is talk a little bit about me. Um, <clears throat> I enjoy talking about me because it's a really easy topic. I know a lot about it. Um, but the reason I do it is uh, twofold. First of all, um, I want to make sure that you feel comfortable that the person that is delivering the lecture material to you has the uh, qualifications to do that. I think I do, but I want to make sure that you see my background so that you can see that, that I should have. Whether I actually deliver the material or not, <clears throat> I've been teaching a long time, so I think I do, uh, but, uh, you know, that remains to be seen. 
Um, and then the other reason that I think you should um, uh, know a little about my background is um, every instructor has biases. Now, I don't mean race, religion, color, creed, sexual preference, and all that sort of stuff. Um, but we, we do have biases, and um, you should have some understanding of, of the background of the person that's uh, instructing you so that you can detect biases at certain points, all right? I'm usually pretty good at highlighting them. One that we don't get into very, very much in this course um, at all is I'm quite negative towards unions. Oh, yeah, um, you cannot teach at Kaplan University unless you belong to a union. Well... There are exceptions. The first exception was uh, a really fantastic uh, instructor, Lloyd Michaels, who hopefully will come back and do some contract teaching. He's retired now. But he was around here so long that he predated the union and, uh, <clears throat> and just uh, didn't sign, and they grandfathered him, so it was no problem. Uh, the other person at the university that does not belong to the union is me, uh, and that's because... Um, I, I was a practicing lawyer um, up until December 31st, 2018, when I re retired from the practice of law. Um, and as a practicing lawyer, not very, too many years ago, we were not allowed to be members of unions. I think it was a bit of a snob thing. Okay, we're professionals. Unions are blue collar um, or, or, you know, white collar in, in the case of the professors, I suppose. Anyway, um, uh, <clears throat> There was really no rationale behind it because um, I, the only way I can practice law is if I belong to the law society who dictates so many rules with respect to how I practice and I have to pay them dues. It sounds a lot like a union. Um, but that aside, um, I, and this is legal uh, uh, stuff, um, how did I wind up teaching then? Years ago, in about 1956, 1958, there was a, a, a large business that wanted to hire a certain person who had some real expertise that they needed. It was a unionized closed shop, which meant you had to belong to the union to work there. And um, the union wanted them, okay? Um, but this person had a problem joining the union. I can't remember whether it was religious or, um, or a, um, uh, a sort of custom uh, anyway, he, he could not belong to the union. He wanted to work there. So everybody wanted him to work there, and he wanted to work there. And so the matter went to court, all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada. And Mr. Justice Rand uh, wrote the opinion of the court and said that what they would do is they would allow him to not be a member of the union, but pay the dues, which is what the union really wants, um, and would be protected by the collective agreement, but could not get involved in union activities. So that's called the RAND formula, okay? And so uh, I, I started working here, and the union sent me the, the form to join, and I said, uh, uh, cannot join a RAND formula, and they kept sending it to me every year, and I had the RAND formula. Finally, I had to actually tell the union the, what the RAND formula was about and why. I was doing that because they were getting quite upset with me. Uh, so anyway, I'm negative towards unions, not because of that, but because um, we're working in a global economy, and this is what the whole course is about, how to do business on a global scale. Um, and other countries have manufacturing at far lower labor wages than we do, less uh, regulatory requirements, and as a consequence, the playing field isn't level, um, and manufacturing jobs disappear. <clears throat> um, and there's even a union uh, uh, problem in our uh, scenario that we'll get to later on. Uh, and so I'm, I'm negative that way because it puts us at a disadvantage internationally. We can do manufacturing, but it's almost always in high-skill, very high-quality um, uh, uh, situations worse in the province of British Columbia because we have the uh, worst labor le legislation on the face of the planet Earth and ergo probably in the universe. Um, but we don't get into that in this course. We did touch on it a bit in Batman 107. Okay. Um, 
So I'm going to talk about myself, uh, my education, my work experience, and my teaching experience. Um, first of all, I got a BA in Canadian science, uh, Canadian history and political science. Uh, it was a, at UBC, it was a good education, um, <clears throat> uh, but it didn't lead anywhere. Like, um, I guess I could teach at a university or a high school, or I could uh, join the civil service, neither of which I wanted to do, both of which I wind up doing, but then that's called life. Um, uh, and, and, but when I graduated, I thought, well, I'll go get a job. And I found a job with a, uh, uh, a bearing manufacturing company made bearings for wheels and other equipment. And they were going to pay me next to nothing for at least a year while they trained me in business. So I thought, well, I don't want to do that. Um, I always wanted to become a lawyer, but um, uh, I wanted to, um, well, I needed money. Anyway, I, I managed to um, uh, raise enough money that I go back to university and I took my MBA because I wanted the MBA law combination because I wanted to do law, but always related to business. So I got into the MBA faculty again at UBC, got my MBA. It's true that generally companies recruit MBA students before they even graduate. So I had a job before I was finished, which made it really hard to write the final thesis. Um, I, I still wanted to go to law school, but again, uh, I needed some financing, and so I thought, well, I'll work for a few years. So I joined the um, what was the Industrial Development Bank, which quickly became the Federal Business Development Bank, which is now the Development Bank of Canada. Why do they keep changing their name? Well, to waste taxpayers' money, first of all, um, but secondly, so that they do something interesting. Um, I'm being a little facetious there, but um, I found it a very stifling, conservative place to work. I did not fit into the corporate culture, uh, but it was great in the sense that it cemented um, all the things that I had learned in the MBA faculty. I was bingo doing on the job. I was writing business plans, analyzing financial statements, um, <clears throat> you know, looking at uh, marketing plans that, uh, and trying to lend money to businesses um, through the uh, Federal Business Development Bank uh, when the businesses could not get money from the um, usual lenders, uh, <clears throat> the conventional lenders. Now, the problem was um, most of the people that worked at the bank were actually recruited from the chartered banks. And the whole point of the FBDB was to lend money when the banks couldn't. And yet the whole mindset of all these people was that um, you know, let's avoid risk whenever we can, rather than saying, okay, we are a risk, um, uh, not adverse lender, the opposite. We're supposed to be lending uh, in higher risk situations. I decided to work two years because I thought two years was, uh, I would not be tainted with this conservative banker uh, aura, uh, and, um, and yet it would show that I could hold a job. So two years to the day I quit, to the surprise of the other credit officers there who did not believe I was going to do it. I mean, here's a you know cushy, easy job, uh, you know good good salary, um, and a wonderful pension at the end of the rainbow. Uh, but it wasn't for me, so I quit and um, I took a job on speculation in Ottawa, uh, with the uh, National Research Bureau in the House of Commons. So I was uh, doing research and writing. Uh, reports to various members of parliament from all the parties. I was there only a short period of time and then I became a um, business assistant, a special assistant to a new minister, um, a new portfolio, the Minister of State for Small Business, who was Len Marchand, um, a native Canadian from Kamloops and uh, one of the uh, nicest men I've ever met. Uh, I think he was the first native senator and uh, might have been the first native cabinet minister. I'm not certain. But anyway, um, I joined his staff as a business assistant um, and it was probably the best job I've ever had in my whole life. I travel around the country flying in a jet star, which is a private uh, jet, uh, you know, with the steward coming down, may I refresh your drink, Mr. Holden? Uh, you know, do you want the steak tonight or do you want the... Uh, the pasta, you know, do you want the New York Times, the Financial Post, stayed at the best hotels, rode around in limousines, carrying the minister's briefcase. Um, but besides that, the other part of my job was to look at all cabinet documents, 
that we're going to go to cabinet um, and uh, write memos for my minister. I'm just checking to make sure that we are recording. Um, <clears throat> so uh, as a consequence, um, uh, I, I had a, I had to get uh, top secret clearance, which means the uh, RCMP investigated my background very carefully. They even knocked on my parents' door uh, back in Vancouver and started asking questions about me, which scared them to no end because they wondered, what's, what, <clears throat> what has my son done? <coughs> um, anyway, um, it, uh, it was a really good job. I really enjoyed it. One of the biggest problems, though, is it is a political job. So I went from being a civil service to a political hack. Those are the, you know, the people that uh, help members of parliament and senators in Canada and congressmen and senators in the United States. I was not like the political hacks around uh, President Trump because, quite frankly, I have ethics. Um, okay, so... Uh, there was a cabinet shuffle after one year, and, and bingo, I wound up working for um, the Minister of National Revenue uh, that is in charge of the Can Canadian Revenue Agency. Um, and uh, Senator Joe Gay from Manitoba, um, a French-Canadian um, politician. And uh, he was one of the hardest people I've ever worked for. Um, he's sort of like President Trump in the sense that he would go into rages and fire people. Um, I, I was lucky. I survived. But I figured out how. Um, if you angered him, uh, you were out the door. Uh, there was very little you could do to redeem yourself. Pardon me, but I figured out um, uh, he was relatively a lonely man. Uh, his wife had passed away and his family were gone. So um, <clears throat> at the end of the day... Um, he would sit in his office and he would uh, have a drink and he would watch TV. So I would go from my office, which wasn't in the House Commons building, over to his office and I'd pop in at the end of the day to chat briefly with him and he'd invite me to have a drink and we'd sit and watch the news together. And so I became a friend um, and so I managed to not get fired. Um, although he did threaten to fire me at one point when I wanted to take French. French-Canadian who doesn't want one of his staff to learn French. It was bizarre. But anyway, I survived. Um, others didn't, and as other people got fired, he would give me their jobs. So I started off as his business assistant. He fired his political assistant, so I became his political assistant. And then he fired his legislative assistant, and I became his legislative assistant. And I'm sort of going, like, I'm not getting paid anymore. I'm just doing more work. But I survived. And again, there was a cabinet shuffle. And then I went back to the Minister of State for Small Business, uh, who was then uh, the Honorable Tony Abbott from uh, Ontario. Um, there it was fun. I did uh, seminars all across the country, huge seminars, um, uh, so that the minister could go out and, and uh, meet with the small business people and get feedback. It was kind of fun. Anyway, um, problem with a political job is that there's a change in government every once in a while and that's what happened and uh, <clears throat> I was doing some uh, political work for uh, Tony and I went into him one day and I said uh, Tony I'm sorry to say this but I've looked at the numbers the government's going to fall and you're going to lose your seat in Mississauga and he said yeah I already know that I've got my next job lined up what about you and I said oh well I plan to go to law school and he said oh okay do you need a letter of reference because uh uh, you know, I'll give you one. I said, oh, yes, please. And he said, okay, you write it, I'll sign it. <laughs> well, okay. Um, <clears throat> that was a very glowing letter of reference, by the way. I wanted to say that I was capable of walking on water, but then um, I thought I'd be kind of embarrassed, you know, because he was one of those ministers that actually read his letters before he signed them. Um, anyway, I got that letter of reference, got one from Joe Gay, and I got one from Len Marshawn, and I applied to law schools. Um, six of them, and it was accepted at UBC, uh, Dalhousie, and um, the University of Ottawa. So I covered the country, West Coast, East Coast, Central Canada. Um, I wound up going to the University of Ottawa. Uh, I could have gone to UBC at that point, um, but they, um, 
I, I met with the advisor and he said, uh, you know, why don't you go somewhere else? And I thought, oh, well, that makes you feel welcome, doesn't it? Um, but he said, you got two degrees from UBC. You want to get a degree from somewhere else. Okay, so Dalhousie was the obvious choice because it was one of the most prestigious law firms in, or law schools in the country. Um, but my wife was going, uh, had been working and was going back to university too. And she wanted to go to the National Theatre School in Canada. They took three men and three women a year talk about tough okay but she got in that was in Montreal so the University of Ottawa was the closest I could get to be with her McGill turned me down because um, strangely um, on the form when it said will you take courses in French I wrote down are you kidding I want to pass apparently that was the wrong thing to put down there um, <clears throat> uh, and anyway I so I went to the University of Ottawa and I don't think it really made a difference in the um, ultimate outcome of my political or my legal career uh, law school fantastic lots of fun very difficult to get into um, once you're in it's really hard to fail um, I had been working for uh, five years and uh, uh, no sorry pardon me uh, two, three, four, yeah, five years. And, um, and so I was used to the nine to five day. And so I would go to the university in the morning, go to my classes and between classes would actually work and study rather than, uh, do other things. Um, and so I pretty much had my evenings to myself. Um, I can remember one time before a midterm exam, going to sleep at 10 o'clock in the morning and being woken up by two in the morning by a student who was uh, desperately cramming at the last minute, and he was surprised that I was actually asleep. Um, but uh, um, I, I found it really enjoyable. I did, uh, you could after second year uh, do Crown, or after first year do some assistance to Crown Council work in, in criminal court. I did that and um, won my first trial there. Uh, and um, I uh, also uh, was on the men's uh, hockey team, the, the B team. I was the captain of the B team. The A team played with other universities. The B team was intramural, uh, so I wasn't that good, but I had lots of fun. Uh, I got chosen for the moot court team, uh, refused uh, that because um, uh, there were so many people involved in it. It wasn't going to be uh, that good, and I didn't look like I was going to get to argue a case, so I thought, no, to heck with it. Uh, but I had a really, really good time. Um, wrote my last exam on uh, May uh, 15th, which was a Friday. On the Saturday, I was on a plane <laughs> back to BC. Um, three years uh, working uh, for ministers and uh, three years at law school. Uh, if anyone is from Ottawa, um, you just have to think of the winters. Uh, blistering cold, the summer's blistering hot and humid, um, and the spring is sort of over like that. It's just all of a sudden a lot of wind blowing all the sand that they put down on the streets. Uh, the fall's nice. Um, uh, if you stay in the city, if you go into the country, there's bugs. So, um, a uh, nice place to visit, uh, but I was glad to get back to BC. I began articling with a medium-sized law firm, Ray Connell Lightbody and Reynolds. Um, it was a great place to article. Article is when you learn the practical side of the law. You go to law school and you learn to argue a case before the Supreme Court. Articles tells you how to find the Supreme, Supreme Court house, okay? Um, and I'm, I'm almost not being facetious. Um, they would send article students out to file documents so you'd learn how to do it. Um, you could uh, make um, applications in chambers. Um, you could uh, go to the land title office and file documents to uh, uh, help people buy and sell property. Um, and then you write your bar ads and then you get called to the bar. So in 1983, I got called to the bar and uh, practiced in uh, corporate commercial, um, uh, marketing and advertising. I've done property law transfers. Um, I do estate uh, or I did wills and estates and secession and I did intellectual property. I also did international trade law, and this is one of the things about the course, and I'll talk about it a little bit later. Um, <clears throat> I, um, I found out that I did international trade law. The market in BC was so small that just by uh, happenstance, um, a lot of my clients were um, international in nature. 
Okay, then I be began practicing law, and um, <coughs> I was, the article firm that I was with um, was going to have a position in their corporate commercial department, and I wanted that. They had a couple of other positions, and I turned them down, uh, waiting for the uh, position in uh, the uh, corporate commercial department. There was a downturn in the economy, and... Um, Collections, which I could have done, went up, of course. Uh, marine uh, law, which is would have been applicable to this course, but not fun, um, didn't entice me. And then, of course, um, the uh, law, uh, the position in the corporate commercial department didn't come out. And so I was unemployed in a recession. Took a long time to get a job, which was a bit disheartening. But I finally uh, joined the uh, uh, a sole practitioner uh, who was um, an Oriental Canadian, and um, his practice was very much with a lot of um, Chinese Canadians. Uh, and so I had uh, my first uh, cross-cultural experiences, which I'll talk about a little later on. Just the negotiation for the job was interesting. Um, you know, you walk in, you go through an interview, you get hired or not hired, not with um, people of certain... Uh, uh, cultures, you have to build up a relationship, and we really had to do that. It took a long time to get a job. Uh, my wife found it very frustrating. Anyway, um, joined his firm, and he had the unmitigated goal very shortly thereafter to have a heart attack and go in the hospital. And so right out of law school, I wound up managing a law firm as well as doing a lot of legal work without the guidance of another lawyer in the office. That was very stressful. He came back to the office, wanted to sell his law firm, and I wanted to know if I wanted to buy it, but I didn't. Um, again, it was one of those cultural things. His clients, a large number of Oriental Canadians who have to have a relationship, um, and I didn't have a relationship with them, and um, I probably would have bought the firm, and they, a lot of them would have gone elsewhere. So I moved to another firm, didn't like that, did all kinds of law, did uh, criminal law, did family law, did everything I had to because I needed clients. I uh, didn't like it, and then I was very fortunate, <clears throat> and I'm, I'm always going to come back and say I'm very fortunate. I have had uh, and hope to continue having a very fortunate life. Fortunate to become the associate in a three-man uh, partnership. I'm not being sexist, it was three men. A Mackay, Dwar, and Turlock. And uh, they had specialties. Bob Mackay was one of the best marketing and advertising lawyers west of Toronto. Um, uh, uh, Mark DeWar did uh, franchising from a different perspective, breaking them as opposed to uh, setting them up. And uh, Lance Sherlock was probably the best intellectual property lawyer west of Toronto, if not in Canada. Uh, anyway, they needed a grunt, someone to do the corporate commercial work and, the, and all the other work that, you know, that they didn't really want to do. And then they trained me in marketing, advertising, and intellectual property. I did not go into franchising. Uh, anyway, um, I was with them for a few years and then became a partner with them. If a lawyer ever says, uh, no, I didn't want to become a partner, uh, they might not be being truthfully honest. Truthfully honest. Now that's redundant, isn't it? Um, they might not be totally honest because uh, most lawyers think that um, becoming a partner is the pinnacle of their career. I thought so. Became a partner. Um, I am negative towards partnerships because I've been in one. Now, I didn't lose money. and I made money, uh, but it was not the most wonderful experience that I was hoping it would be. And I had a lot of conflict with the, uh, with the partners. Not over, you know, being personal, personality conflicts. It was known as business conflicts. Um, so eventually I became a partner with them. And uh, and then the partnership blew up. Uh, and that's when I realized again how fortunate I was. Because um, just before the partnership, uh, just before I became a partner actually, um, Kaplan Oak College, as it then was, contacted Bob Mackay and asked him if he would do some more teaching in the evening classes at uh, at the college. And he said, no, I'm a partner now. I'm far too important for that. And um, But he said, I have a grunt in the office that might be interesting. And this is why I'm, the first part of why I was fortunate. Um, I, f I was asked if I might like to teach in a, the course in the evening. 
Um, when I was at UBC, I took the Bad M 107 course, the introductory law course, business law. And I thought it was the most fantastic course. It confirmed that I wanted to become a lawyer. The instructor, Peter Watts, was a gentleman. He was humorous. He was intelligent. He was incredibly capable, practiced law as well as taught. And I thought, well, I would like to teach that course. I didn't want to teach, teach, but I wanted to teach that course. Well, it turned out that the course being taught at Kaplan University was identical to the course at UBC because it was one of those courses that was transferable. <clears throat> um, and uh, so I got to teach it. Not only that, it was the same textbook that I had used. Okay, um, And so I was very fortunate to do that. I did it a couple of evenings, uh, classes, and... Uh, uh, and then I became a partner, um, and they asked me to do it again. And so I thought, well, I better talk to the other partners. So I talked to the partners, and here's one of the reasons why I don't like partnerships. Um, uh, they, they were all excited. Oh, yeah, you know, teach there as a partner, and, you know, you get the partner name out there, and, you know, all those business students, they may become clients of the firm. This is wonderful. And, and then the money is, you know. And I said, well, you know, the money isn't that good. And they said, no, no, but, you know, it comes into the firm. It gets divided amongst the three of us, and, you know, so every bit helps. And I went, what? Um, because you're a partner and you're doing work related to the partnership, it is partnership income, even if you're doing it supposedly after hours. Because if you're a partner, you're a partner 24-7. Okay. And I thought, man, there is no way that I'm willing to do that much work for one-third of the salary. So I turned Kaplan University down. But shortly after there, after there, after that, um, my partnership exploded. Both uh, two, uh, uh, Dewar had gone and I had joined, right? So Bob McKay and Lance Sherlock wanted to become partners with bigger firms. Uh, they were really into the partnership prestige thing. So they um, one day just announced that, uh, you know, Bob is going to go to Russell and Dumoulin and Lance was going to go to uh, Swinton and Company and I was going to go, uh, hmm, nowhere. Um... I guess the only good thing is, uh, well, two good things. Uh, neither of them became partners with those firms, um, and I wasn't on the lease, so um, they got stuck with uh, settling the lease. <clears throat> anyway, uh, suddenly I was going to be a sole practitioner and had to find an office, hire staff, get a bank loan, um, you know, do all, all that work. And I thought, oh, you know, that's really tough. Three days after the partnership exploded, and I'm not talking a month, I'm not talking, you know, three months, uh, you know, I'm talking three days after the partnership exploded, um, Kaplan University called me, college as it then was, and, uh, and said they had a full-time teaching load there, and was I interested? Um, oh yeah, I was. So I came out and I talked to Greg Lee, who was the dean of business then, and then he became the president of the university and, and has since retired. And I was going through this interview, and I thought, okay, if I have to have this, uh, um, or, you know, I, if my practice doesn't work, then I'm going to, you know, at least be able to teach and pay the mortgage. Um, halfway through the interview, he sort of went, um, Peter, um, I, I sense some reluctance here, um, and this is really important to you, okay, what I'm going to say now. And I said, um, uh, yes, you know, I really want to teach um, because I enjoy it. Um, but I don't want to give up the practice of law either. And he said, well, you know, why do you want to start practicing law? And I thought, is this one of those trick questions you get in the job interview? Hi, we want to hire you full time. Are you going to have a, a, a job on the side? I did not know how to handle it. So I thought, well, OK, honesty is the best policy. And I said, I'm sorry, Greg, I don't understand. Um, you want me to teach full-time, and yet you want me to have a law practice on the side? And he said, absolutely, because nobody teaches in the School of Business at Capilano College unless they are also doing consulting work in their area of expertise. So if you have a course from someone that's an accountant, they will be doing accounting work in the real world. If you have someone that teaches you finance, they will be with a chartered bank or, or whatever in the real world. If you have someone teaching marketing, they have experience in, in the real world, okay? Um, and so I, I got the best of both worlds. I got to keep um, my uh, law practice going, and I began teaching at Capilano College. 
At the same time, I also had a chance to teach a couple of evening, uh, evening courses in the MBA faculty at UBC, uh, <clears throat> the entrepreneurship course. And uh, so I was doing that, um, and I associated myself with a downtown law firm called Street and Company. Um, nothing to do with that uh, TV program, Street Legal. Just um, uh, uh, Bill Street, who's a, another real gentleman. Um, anyway, I, uh, during this pe period of time, uh, married though I was, I was having an intimate love affair, not with a woman, with my car. I'd get up in the morning and I'd drive to Capilano College and I'd teach, and then I'd get my car and I'd drive downtown and I'd do law work. And then I'd get my car and I'd drive to UBC and I'd teach, and then I'd get my car and I'd drive home. Um, I was wearing out. UBC came to an end because I was just teaching while a uh, professor was on sabbatical. Um, and at that point, my wife, who had been a professional actress, um, had quit because she didn't like it, worked for a while, burned herself out, had quit, I wanted to get back in the workforce, and she said, um, why don't you move your law practice home? And I went, huh? and she said, what? And I said, well, if I don't have a downtown office and I'm wearing a, pin, a three-piece pinstripe suit with a briefcase, who's going to take me seriously as a lawyer? And uh, she said, well, you know, why don't you talk to your... Uh, uh, clients and see what they think. So I thought, well, okay, that's kind of interesting. I do marketing and advertising. Maybe I should do a marketing survey of my clients. And I talked to my clients and I found out that business was changing. Um, it was um, less uh, in-office contact, a lot more by phone and, and fax and uh, eventually cell phone and email. Um, and my clients said they didn't care where I was. Um, I could be on the face of the planet Mars. Uh, what they liked was they could phone and get through to me. So I moved my law practice home and uh, we had a rule. I did the banking so that I had that contact, personal contact with our, our bankers and I answered the phones. So somebody dialed up, you know, uh, Peter Old and I go, yeah, can I speak to Peter? I go, oh, oh, is that, is that you, Peter? Um, so that they could get right through to me. When I was teaching, I had a pager because there were, you know cell phones were just starting out, um, and if uh, they wanted me, they would page me and I would step out of the classroom. Didn't happen too often, but there was that potential. Um, working out of the home, um, I was still embarrassed about it. You know, people would say, uh, "Peter, where's your law office?" And I'd say, "My home," and they'd go, "What? In my home?" Um, but I, I did find out that I was uh, on the cutting edge of new technology. We always think new technology, high tech. What's the next high tech? What's the next iPhone, the i400? Um, <clears throat> uh, but uh, it's, it's not, it's bringing new um, ways of doing business to existing um, operations. And uh, working in the home, uh, the home-based businesses were just coming into uh, fruition. Uh, again, because communications techniques were allowing this. Um, I got a call from a lawyer one time. And, oh, you know, my name is Jeremy Belmont III, and I want to speak to Peter Holden. And I thought, whoa, you know, what files this and what's going on? And I said, uh, speaking. And he said, are you the guy that works out of his home? And I went, ooh, uh, yes. And he said, what's it like? Turned out he was stuck on the Lionsgate Bridge for like an hour and a half heading into the office. And that happens a lot. And so he just had it. He was a partner with the downtown law firm and he said, I'm just moving my law practice home. Uh, and so I told him about it, the advantages and disadvantages. A short while later, I got a call from a, a, an accountant where we had a mutual client and he asked me about it and he moved his accounting practice home. There are advantages and disadvantages. I'll tell you one anecdote about the advantages. <laughs> um, I had a client in Australia negotiating a contract, and we were contact dealing with each other by phone all the time. And he called me up and he said, Peter, I'm, I've got to talk to you uh, tomorrow. <clears throat> I'm getting the final version of the contract, and I want you on the line as we go through it because I'm going to sign it then. And I said, no problem. And he said, yes, there is a problem. And I said, what's the problem? And he says, it'll be at 5.30 Vancouver time. I said, no problem. And he said, oh, is that okay? And I said, sure, call me. Um, try that with a downtown lawyer. Um, you're going to pay a huge amount of money uh, if he has to get up early and go into the office or she has to uh, uh, you know, arrange to have this uh, take place at home and give out her personal telephone number, that sort of thing. 
Anyway, um, for me, it was no problem. Uh, my business manager was my wife. So, uh, you know, no sexual harassment in the office. Um, we woke up at 5.15, got up, walked downstairs, got the coffee from the coffee maker that was already percolating, went outside, got in the hot tub, sat there with, you know, the walk around phone, watching the sun come up, sipping coffee, the phone goes off, Kathleen answers at one of those rare occasions when she answers it, and she goes, Peter Olden's office, I'll see if he's in. And she says, are you in? I said, I'm in the hot tub. She hands me the phone. I negotiate the final part of the contract for my client, billing him, sitting in my hot tub, drinking coffee, watching the sun come up. That is the advantage of working out of your home. The commute is phenomenal, from upstairs to downstairs to the coffee machine. The disadvantage is um, if you have children or other distractions, um, children don't know when dad's in the office. I had two young children. Um, one was uh, four or five and the other was... She must have been four, and the other one was two. Um, <clears throat> one time when my wife is out, um, I am sitting at my desk, looking out my window, working on files that um, for a court case that's coming up. And all the documents are on the table behind me. Um, I have a, a stamp, chikung, 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 which puts my name, address, and telephone number, uh, and barrister and solicitor on all the documents so you don't have to print them out all the time. Uh, I'm sitting on the phone, I'm talking to a client, and all of a sudden I hear chukung, 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 and I think to myself, Kathleen's out, I'm sitting here, who's doing the kachung kachung? And I turn around, and there was my oldest daughter, and she had seen me do it, and so she was going down the row of documents, stamping them for me. Unfortunately, not in the right places. Uh, so that was uh, that's the problem. Then one other time, uh, I was with a client in my office, and she burst in walking through saying, Dad, I have my affidavit. And I thought, oh boy. But my client was a really nice fellow, and he said, um, wow, I have a hard time remembering that word. Uh, so those are the drawbacks, but the advantages outweigh them. Not only that, but there's financial advantages. You get to write off some of your uh, mortgage and other expenses in your home against your business. Okay, so I've been doing that. Um, I, when I started out, I did everything I, that came in the door, uh, but now I was doing uh, corporate commercial work, uh, marketing and advertising, estate planning and secession. Um, I did some property uh, transfer uh, stuff for a while when I had, uh, I worked out an agency relationship with a paralegal, but I did not like that. It was just too routine. Um, went to court, um, I had the pleasure of um, uh, doing small claims court trials, BC Supreme Court trials, and even one case in the BC Court of Appeal. Um, I, I have a lot of uh, lawyer friends, of course, and uh, they were always envious because a lot of them did lit litigation. You just don't automatically go to the Court of Appeal, and none of them had. Um, so uh, that's, the, that's the legal career. Now, as far as teaching goes, I teach, obviously, BAD M107, uh, Canadian Business Law, BAD M 307, Canadian Business Law 2. Um, I teach this course. Um, I have taught entrepreneurship, BAD M 268, and I have taught BAD M 101, the uh, management course. Um, I have taught at UBC, of course, as I mentioned, and I also taught international business law in Vietnam at the Open University. And we'll come back and we'll talk about that more later during the, my videos uh, because of the cross-cultural aspect of, the, of that whole thing. I guess I did okay because the university um, gave me a two-way ticket. Um, and I came back and I've, uh, I've been teaching ever since. And I do really enjoy it, although I enjoy more contact with the students that I get to do. Okay, so that's my educational background, my business background, and my uh, teaching background. Um, so I think I have the credentials to deliver the course materials, and uh, hopefully we will get through them. Um, what is next on the course outline? Um, let's see. The next most important thing is uh, on page three of the course outline, where it talks about the evaluation profile. Um, you'll have a term assignment uh, worth 20%. Um, that term assignment will also give you a topic for an oral presentation worth 10%. There will be a midterm exam worth 25%. Um, there will be a um, final exam worth 25%. And uh, the uh, thing about the final exam is that... Um, page. 
this there. I have put a grading profile sheet on uh, eLearn and it gives more details about this. And I'm also going to talk about it a bit more in this video. Um, but the, uh, the term assignment will give you the, uh, uh, the topic for the oral presentation. Um, and your final exam I wanted to mention was um, uh, uh, non-cumulative to the greatest extent possible. I say to the greatest extent possible because there's no way you can divide the legal material perfectly. Ah, that's there, that's there, and they don't affect each other um, because that would just not be realistic. But to the greatest extent possible, um, it uh, it will um, not include material for the first half of the term. Um, I mentioned the uh, lecture schedule which is posted to eLearn and on there it will say uh, when your assignments are due more importantly and something that the students drive instructors nuts about is that it says when the midterm exam will be and what topics are covered okay when the final is or the review for the final exam is and what topics will be covered and uh, one of the problems is um, just before the midterm exam, I will get telephone calls, not this year, but in the past, and lots of emails from students saying, oh, Mr. Holden, what's on the midterm exam? What does it cover? And that's the first time you've asked that question. But unfortunately, it's about the thousandth time the instructors have answered it and it drives them nuts when it's on the forms and uh, the students don't read them so just a heads up that uh, uh, if you need to know what's on the exam it is on my lecture schedule um, okay now next on the list is um, talking about the course itself this course started off as part of an international business program, which um, eventually we got funding cuts and had to uh, cut it back, and now we're expanding it more. Uh, but when it was first taught and I was asked to teach it, there was um, an essay. And uh, it, there's all sorts of problems with the essay. Um, you learn a lot about a certain topic and another student learns a lot about a certain topic, but unless there's some way of everybody getting to read everybody's essays, which is next to impossible, um, then you're only learning chunks. And so I changed and we put in some law and people were doing case studies on various aspects of the course. Um, well, I found the same problem. You would learn a lot about a certain legal aspect during the case law and uh, another student would do the same, but there was no cross-fertilization. Um, with the new thrust of uh, 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 designing courses to deliver better, um, I came up with the concept of turning this course into a business-like scenario. So there is this scenario package, and... Um, what it does is it outlines a business that I made up which is dealing in the province of British Columbia and manufacturing a product here and obviously it's a high-end luxury product otherwise we could not afford to do it. Um, and this business is operating in the province of British Columbia and the whole thrust of the course is international trade and law so how do we get from there to there? And it's easy. Um, this business is now going to start going into the global markets. And so they have to learn international trade, and they have to learn the international law related to that trade. Um, so what I, what's in this package is an introductory memo, very extensive, about the history of our company. Then there's a, a sheet that outlines the, who the shareholders of the corporation are, who the directors of the corporation are. And then there's... Um, uh, the structure of the organization. The organizational chart shows the, the sales department, operations department, the finance department, the marketing department, and the HR department. Then there's financial information. Last year's financial statement, this year's financial statement, the income statement. I didn't do the balance sheet. Um, I am not an accountant, and I couldn't get that, <laughs> couldn't get that far along. But then there's another sheet that outlines the revenue. 
Okay, how much money we're making and the labor costs and the manufacturing costs. Okay, and then we get into a detailed number of pages about the various products uh, that the uh, the business has. Um, and that is on page 19, so let's just go to page 19. So we, we do peak performance pontoon skis, three different types. Um, we, um, uh, we have uh, ski, ski poles for white water skiing. So, um, and then following that, there's a whole series, uh, there's one big memo about going global. Um, and then there are a series of memos from a lawyer. So let's back up. We have this business and we run the class like a business. So I'm like a schizophrenic person, all right? I walk in and you watch my lectures, I'm Peter Holden, okay? But then as the business is beginning to be run, I can be Benton Counter, the CEO and president of the business. Now we have to have legal advice from our law firm, which is um, uh, Bellow, Argue, and Harangue. And William Argue, whose name is Will Argue, and with a name like that, you gotta be a lawyer, right? <laughs> um, is going to um, uh, have to give legal advice to the business. So I will be, will argue on those occasions. Um, and, um, the idea is when you start dealing with the project, um, you will either be a, a team that's investigating a certain topic for the business, in other words, you are employees of Peak Performance Pontoons, um, or you will be an associate lawyer with that law firm doing a report to your boss, will argue, to help Peak Performance Pontoons. So the first batch of memos, um, uh, or memo rather from, uh, well there's three of them actually, from page one to seven, is the history of the business. Um, and then later on, um, there are, oh I'm sorry, there's also the organizational chart for the law firm, um, and um, some memoranda from the, the lawyer. Okay, um, but, uh, and after the financial statement material um, and the peak performance products, uh, there's a board of uh, uh, directors agenda. Uh, every year we've always had a very formal board meeting because you're all employees and so for that board meeting I see your directors and we have this directors meeting and we meet in you know one of the fancier rooms at Capilano University and I bring in coffee and tea and muffins and things and uh, you're expected to be in formal business attire and we did some strategic planning um, <clears throat> to, to go global because we don't know anything about it um, and so we do the strategic planning in the board meeting and then you get to learn what happens in a board meeting and we'll actually have one. We'll do it on teams. Pardon me. And, um, uh, and we, we come up with a plan. Okay, we, we want to maybe outsource. Uh, we want to uh, deal with, uh, pardon me, a company in Australia. We want to uh, start marketing elsewhere in Canada. We need to um, look at various aspects of like how do we get our product there? Oh, we should talk to a freight forwarder. All these sort of things. Okay, um, well, that's great at a board meeting, but you know, if you have a board meeting and then you all go home and say, well, why didn't we do a good job, then nothing happens. So, um, uh, Benton Counter of Peak Performance Pontoons then turns around and he, and he sets up teams. Uh, teams to look at freight forwarding, teams to look at letters of credit, uh, teams to look at market, how we market our product, uh, uh, corporate social opportunity, um, outsourcing, all sorts of things. So we have all these teams and the teams report back. This is the term project. You are required to do a memo back to your boss and it's more extensive than a usual memo. Memos in businesses are quite often just little instruction things that they fire around like one pagers, you know, half a page, you know, look into this, do that. But the memo that I give uh, to my staff is very extensive. Um, and so I say, give me an extensive memo back. I don't want a business report. I don't have time for business report. I don't want a bibliography. I don't want footnotes. I assume that my staff 
do the research, okay? Um, and so consequently, if you do the research and um, you plagiarize, uh, you're going to get fired, okay? Um, so I expect you to do the research and I expect you to provide me a substantial memo on that topic. Practical material, not what a letter of credit is. I want to know where do you go to get one? I want to know how much it costs. How long does it take? That's business material, okay? So those are the memos that come back to me. Um, uh, for um, will argue, um, I'll use um, alternate dispute resolution. You will see that there were numerous lawsuits against our company over the last year, just one of those really weird years. Um, so Benton Counter is upset with the legal process, okay? That's a lot of money being spent. So Will Argue says, well, you know, there's a better way. It's called alternate dispute resolution, arbitration, mediation and arbitration. So maybe we should prepare a presentation for the business on mediation and arbitration and suggest that's the way they go in the future. So he doesn't, he's not going to do it. He's going to assign it to somebody. So he sends a memo to one of his staff or, uh, and he says, you know, here, you, you three people look into this and get back to me. Okay. Um, and so... You have to remember that if you're working for Benton Counter, you send a memo back to Benton Counter. If you're working for Will Argue, you send the memo back to Will Argue. If you send them to Peter Holden, I'm going to throw them in the basket because I don't know anything about this. I'm an instructor at Capilano University. I'm not part of the business, okay? Um, if you have to email me um, as Benton Counter, uh, there will be bcounter at capilanouniversity.ca. Um, that comes to me as Benton Counter. So you got a question for your boss, that's how you do it. If you send that email to me, I'm going to go, I don't know, I'm going to throw it away uh, or delete it. Yeah, delete. Um, <clears throat> or conversely, if you've uh, got a question, uh, arbitration, like, oh, what's, 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 what's Peter mean about that? Peter has nothing to do with that. Will Argue um, has something to do with that. So you have to contact Will Argue. And then you have to send the memo back to Will Argue. Okay, um, so we're going to run it as much as a business as possible. It's a lot easier when we can do it in class. But hey, businesses right now are operating virtually uh, because of COVID-19. So I should be able to operate my fictitious business uh, virtually through COVID-19. Uh, um, then uh, let's see. So there's a board of directors at the beginning of the course. Then people do their presentations and the presentations everybody will watch, okay? Logistically, we're working on that. Um, then then that way, um, everybody in the business is up to speed on everything else. So it's not like the essay, it's not like the case law. This is how businesses work. Um, <clears throat> okay, then um, uh, at the end of the term, we have a final board meeting when we vote on what to do because we're gonna have all sorts of options. Um, but what, what, which of those options do we want to do? So it may be that the people that look into marketing, if there are some students in the, in the class that are really interested in marketing, then we'll get them into that team. Um, you know, how do we market now? How should we market in the global economy? Um, and there may be, well, let's do, uh, you know, massive advertising all over the world and it'll only cost us $3.8 billion. Um, or we can do flyers, or we can do uh, you know CDs, or or whatever. So there's all sorts of options, and the marketing department doesn't tell us what we're going to do. The marketing department reports to the board of directors, and says here's the options, and then the board of directors selects them. So that's what we're going to do. Um, there, uh, I have uh, at this point 34 students enrolled. Um, so if there are more, I do take more. Um, I, have, <clears throat> I have to, under my contract, take 35 students. I generally take 36 because that's what business takes. If there are more trying to get in the course, I take up to 40. If that happens, then I have another project where two people work for peak performance pontoons and two people work for a company in Australia and they actually negotiate a distribution agreement. Um, okay, and so the last thing is the Gdamit River Rafting Supplies memo to their staff about that if necessary. So I think it's absolutely imperative that you all immediately, if not sooner, read the material in here. 
because there's no point in having a board of directors meeting if I say, okay, so like, uh, how do we market our product now? Everybody goes, oh, I don't know. No, it's, that's like score. I don't do that. Because uh, you wouldn't walk into a board meeting um, for your business, uh, uh, you know, unprepared. I mean, I guess some people do, but they generally wind up being uh, uh, dismissed from the board. All right. So that's why it's a, going to be a challenge to deliver this course uh, with the pandemic um, is because they're... Um, the uh, presentations, I think, what we're going to do is we're going to have everybody, instead of presenting in front of the class, you're going to do a video. And then everybody in the class watches that video. Um, and I um, provide you uh, feedback with an instructor's marking guide about things that you did really well, things that you could do to improve your presentation skills. All the other students in their teams, so that we don't have too many emails flying back and forth, there's already going to be a gazillion. Um, you will do a peer critique form so that you're providing um, uh, suggestions and criticisms to your classmates about how they can perform it. And the reason is that if it, I won't catch everything, but they will catch some things. So those peer critiques once you've prepared them in your teams about a presentation that you've watched, you send to me. I look at them, okay, because in years gone by, um, there has been some very, very instructive criticisms, like, it sucked, okay. Um, that peer critique is going in the garbage. Um, I'm not even going to waste time giving it to the, uh, the, the presenters. But once you've done the pre a presentation you will receive a marking uh, guide sheet from me and then I will collect all those other peer critiques and I will send them to you as well you'll look at those throw them away right because it's over it's a class thing yeah he's trying to run it like a business but um, so uh, <clears throat> you know and, and, and I know I did a good job so you know why should I read those well um, that's not good okay the idea is we're trying to prepare you for the real world out there um, and so what you want to do is you want to improve your skills. I, you know, if I said, here, take these, read them and improve them, you go, yeah, 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 yeah. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to force you. <laughs> uh, you have to look at my sheet, you have to look at the peer critiques, and then you have to send a memo to me. Um, and I don't care if you address this one to uh, Benton Counter or if you address this one to uh, Will Argue or if you address it this one to Peter Holden. Um, you send it in and suggest uh, at least three ways that you can improve your presentation skills. Okay. Um, all right. The contract assignment um, is worth 10%. And what we're going to do in that is you are going to, um, I'm going to give you a little scenario. And I'm going to give you a, a law precedent and you're going to assign intellectual property rights of a new product to our corporation. Um, and what I'm looking for here is identifying the party's right and putting in the signature lines, which I pounded and pounded home in Bad M 107. And hopefully the other instructors did too, because there's no point in having a contract if you haven't got the right parties uh, bound to it. Um, and, then, uh, and then we talk uh, about... Um, uh, you know, how to uh, assign intellectual property rights. Uh, class participation is a, a bit of a difficulty. Um, one of the things in the past that we have done is in class, students could bring in articles and give them to me and we could discuss them. And uh, we'd bring in guest speakers. Um, well, obviously, under COVID-19, that's not a good idea. So I'm going to talk about virtual class participation. It's worth 10% of your grade, um, and if you can, you know, not bother with 10%, then don't bother doing anything. But you can uh, provide me articles or cases that relate to international trade um, or, um, uh, you know, information about government programs not related to your topic because you don't get marks for doing something related to your topic. You're getting marks for your topic already. Um, and then um, I can circulate them and we can actually uh, have a Teams meeting and discuss them. Um, you can actually get a guest speaker if you knew someone that worked for the 
Export Development Corporation, um, they could do a very quick video and they could send it to me and I could uh, distribute it to the class. Um, uh, and there may be some other clever ways out there that you can think. Um, in our business scenario as employees, some of the things you could do as an employee to, um, to help the business outside of just doing your job, uh, you would get uh, class participation marks for that. Um, and also, you doing the peer critiques is one of the things you're going to get class participation for. You get marks for doing your presentation, um, but you're going to you're going to you know lose marks if you don't do the peer critiques, or you know if you go through the motions and you don't do a good job, then you will um, wind up uh, with um, uh, not very good uh, class participation marks. Um, I think that's the works about the course. What I would like to do now is talk about how to pass the course. Um, and I am going to post to Moodle, Moodle, I still call it Moodle sometimes, to eLearn um, a, how many pages? One, two, three pages? Yeah, one three-pager that I do for Bad M107, the new students, and it tells them how to pass the course. And um, I'm going to apologize right now because you're third and fourth year students for the most part. Some of you are second year. Um, you've already developed your study habits. And this, you might say, oh, how condescending of you to suggest that I do these things. Okay. Um, I find it absolutely necessary for first year students. It may be of help to you. So if it's of help to you, then refer to it. But um, uh, if, if you think, uh, oh, well, you know, this like treating me like a grade five student, then, uh, then just please ignore this. But I really do want you to, to uh, get through the course and do well. Um, the first thing on there is attendance. Well, <laughs> no attendance, but what it means is watch the videos. Take notes from the videos, okay? Because my lecture guide and what I say in the video is what you're going to be um, tested on, but not everything in the lecture guide um, covers everything I say, okay? Um, cell phones and computers, um, I tell students to stay off them when they're in class. As a matter of fact, I, I got the, um, uh, the reputation as a computer slammer because, you know, students would be in my class, they'd be playing the latest NFL game on their computer, and I'd walk around lecturing, and I'd walk down, I'd be standing beside them, they're still playing, they go, and I'd go, <laughs> and slam their computer shut, uh, which I probably shouldn't do. If I caught their fingers, I'd be up on charges. Anyway, um... Uh, try not to um, use cell phones and computers when you're watching the videos so that you don't, um, uh, you know, other programs so that you, you pay attention, right? Buy the textbook, okay, we've already dealt with that. Uh, then there's, um, you buy the textbook, uh, there's no point in buying a textbook unless you read it. Um, there are no end of chapter questions. Um, that's with respect to the textbook for Bad M107, so ignore that. But there are practice problems. We will be doing practice problems on certain uh, topics, okay? And then um, when we're finished uh, with that topic, uh, I will do a video talking about the uh, problems. Oh, good, you don't actually have to do the problems, do you? Because I don't ask you to hand them in. So you don't have to do them. You just watch the video and look at the problem. Watch the video look at the problem. You do not learn well that way. Okay, if you try to do the problem first, then you watch my video explaining the answers, then you go, ah, uh, okay, and you learn better. Index cards. Um, I got through law school with index cards. Put a case name on one side, flip it over, there's the ratio of decedent on the other side. I put a section of a statute that I absolutely had to know on one side, the definition on the other side. So I did the index cards, Whew, done the index cards. Now I don't have to worry about it, right? No, you do the index cards and then you practice with them, okay? Um, I used to carry them around in my pocket of my, of my uh, pants and my, and my heavy coat when I was at uh, university. And I, I figured everybody figured I was about 180, 190 pounds, okay? Because I had all these index cards. Whenever I had a moment, I'd sit down and I'd go through them. I was in Ottawa. My wife was in, in uh, Montreal. Um, Friday, I'd finish my classes at uh, like 2.30 or something. I'd go down and I'd get on the train from, Mont from Ottawa to Montreal. And I'd sit in the you know, bar car and drink beer. Actually, I didn't because I didn't start drinking beer until later in life. Um, anyway, um, but I could I could sit there and I could watch the scenery go by. 
where I could sit there and I could go through my index cards, which I did. I got down there uh, to Montreal. I'd go and see my wife to have quality time. Uh, my wife's idea of quality time is let's go shopping. <laughs> Yay! Uh, just what uh, some guys uh, don't like doing, and I'm one of them, uh, but but I would do it. We would go shopping. We'd go into a shop, and um, the clerk would say, can I help you, sir? And I'd say, yes, do you have a chair? And she'd go, yeah, there's one there. And I'd go, thank you. And I'd sit down, and I'd go through my index cards. My wife would try it on a, on a dress, and she'd come out, and she'd say, what do you think, dear? And I would say, oh, wow, that's you. That's really nice. That looks really good on you. And then she'd come out with another one and say, and, and this one? I'd go, no, it doesn't do anything for you. Uh, not the, I would really know. Okay, <laughs> uh, but I had to appear interested. I was interested. But anyway, I would sit there and do my cards. So when it came uh, time to do part A of my exam, um, I uh, could do them like that. Saves a lot of time. Um, all right, uh, if you don't like doing the index cards, you know, you're high tech. High tech. Bring out your phone. There's a program called Quizlet which is like an index card. You type something on one side of the card, you flip it over and you type the answer on the other, and then you sit there and you go, you can sit in the cafeteria and look cool. I am so popular. I'm texting, look at this, all my likes. Oh, I like that index card. Everybody thinks, whoa, look at that person. You know, wow, eh? <clears throat> and uh, you're studying. So you can look cool and study. It's wonderful. Um, before we do the midterm exam, we do part C of last year's midterm exam. <coughs> um, and uh, before we do the final, uh, we review last year's final. Do the final ahead of time before I review them. You will do better on the exam. Because if you sit there and you go, Answer, oh yeah, answer, oh yeah, answer, oh yeah, answer, oh yeah. You think you've learned, okay, but you haven't. Ask questions in class. How do we do this? You can't. Um, email me, okay, um, uh, and uh, you use my coaching hours, all right? And the last part of that is, um, uh, you can read it. It might be relevant, but most of you are uh, past that stage. But I have actually, I had students that came and failed. And they'd come in and they'd go, can I do some extra work? You know, and they'd bump up my mark, please. And um, I always say uh, no. Because my job is to make sure that you know the material and the course well enough to at least get a D. And um, uh, if I do a little bit of extra work to bump you up, you're not learning the course and the material, in the, or the material in the course, and so I will not just bump you up. Um, okay, let's see. I'm just going to run through my list to make sure I've covered everything. All right, I think I have covered everything. Um, one of the things I want you to be careful about is uh, plagiarism in the uh, memos. Oh, I should talk about one other aspect of the memo, which I probably will later. Two, two aspects of the memo that you have to do for me. One is, um, think that this is a business. Your boss gives you a memo, and if you came in your boss and you said, um, uh, how many pages has this got to be, boss, and uh, should it be uh, triple-spaced or double-spaced, uh, you're going to get fired. Okay, the boss doesn't have time for that. Um, so my attitude is I give you a job, figure out what, what I really want, okay, and then start writing your memo, and when you're finished talking about what's necessary, stop. It might be one page, haha, -ha, I doubt it, but it might be um, seven pages, okay? Um, should it be triple space? Should it be double space? Should I be putting the margins tighter, wider, what... You know, I had, last year I had somebody actually bring in the margins with the heading and everything and triple spaced. It was about a page long. It didn't answer the problem. And they said, but hey, it's like, you know, a perfect size for a memo. And they failed. OK, so um, you wouldn't ask your boss that. So don't ask me that. Um, the other thing about the memo is I do not want a bibliography or footnotes, but there might be some business program that is incredibly important. So you talk about it in the memo and you want to 
you want to give me the reference, okay? So you just, you know, you're writing along <clears throat> and you're saying, um, uh, the decision in the court case of Regina versus Dudley and Stevens was particularly important in this aspect. Um, and then put in brackets uh, 14 QBD 273, which is the 14th volume of the Queen's Bench Division, page 273, and then your boss can say, you know, I'd really like to read that, and then he doesn't have to get on the phone. Hi, oh darn, you're not there. Okay, I'll leave a message, and hopefully you get back to me. Um, in your memo, um, you know, okay, so I just read the, okay, I feel confident that you've covered it. I don't have to look at it, but if I feel, hmm, uh, I don't know, I think I'd really like to read that, then I can be able to do that, okay? Um, okay. Um, no simple downloads. My idea as a boss is if I want to learn about the export development program, I could go online and I could spend my time reading it. So there's no difference between my going online and reading it and look, reading it in your, your memo. There are aspects, I think in terms of the business, if I wanted the Export Development Corporation, I want to know, is there an office in Vancouver? Can you get in touch with them on phone? Can you deal with them by email? Are they friendly, user friendly? Um, uh, you know, and, and is there a cost for their service? I don't want to say, the Export Development Corporation was formed in 1842 under the auspices of this government department and is going through all these various changes over the years. I don't give up heck about any of that okay i'm business we're trying to make a buck okay so uh treat the memos that way what does the boss need alternate dispute resolution does he want to know all about the advantages and disadvantages no he's already talked about that in the in uh in uh, uh the lectures okay uh or pardon me in the memo he gave it to me so i'm not going to feed it back to him and say there i filled three pages now i only need one more and i got four pages that's probably enough um <clears throat> so I uh, think in terms of this memo, meaning you're either going to be promoted or demoted. Um, and uh, great. And hopefully um, hopefully we can have some fun. Okay, I really enjoy the course. Um, it's the first time I've taught it online, so it's going to be a real challenge. But I do enjoy it. Um, if you have any questions about this video um, or any, any of the things I've talked about, uh, please feel free to email me. Thank you very much.